In today's lecture, uh, we will be talking uh, about uh, speed sensors, um, and uh, then we will be talking about uh, acceleration sensors. Uh, you will see that uh, many principles of uh, speed sensors are similar to principles of uh, position sensors, so I'm sure you will recognize uh, some of them uh, when we uh, from the position sensors. Uh, we will start with uh, the sensor that is using the properties of uh, optics. Uh, it's called an optoelectronic sensor in general. Uh, it could be also called an incremental encoder, for example. Uh, on this picture, you can see the typical structure of such a sensor, as uh, you may find it uh, in uh, speed measuring applications. Uh, it is basically composed of, of a ring with holes or teeth that you see on the left. Uh, the number of holes um, can vary. Um, here in this picture, we have just a few of them, but uh, you can have uh, more that you see in the picture. Uh, in um, some cases, if it's possible due to space constraints, then uh, you have 60 holes or 60 teeth. Uh, the principle is shown on the right. Uh, we have a light source. Uh, here it's shown as a bulb but uh, it can be an LED, for example, or it can be even a fluorescent light, but the most typical today is uh, an LED. Uh, this light source is producing a light beam that is uh, going through the hole uh, in the ring, and uh, this light beam is detected by a detector of light. Uh, the de detector of light is uh, a photodiode, phototransistor, or it could be even a photoresistor, in most cases, it is a phototransistor because uh, it has the fastest uh, reaction and highest sensitivity. Uh, so we can see that uh, when the light beam is passing through the hole, then it is visible for the light detector. If uh, the light beam is being blocked by the gap between the holes, then uh, it's not visible by the light detector and uh, we see another signal. So the output signal that we see on the detector is a rectangular signal, as you can see here. And uh, this is uh, what we uh, are getting to our control system. And now it's clear that if we count the pulses per unit of time, uh, we are able to get the speed of uh, rotation. Uh, for this, we need to know the number of holes or number of, uh, of uh, teeth that we have on the now on the sensor. Uh, the reason why it's typically done as 60 is that uh, this signal is uh, in most cases connected to a frequency counter and uh, a frequency counter can uh, show us uh, the frequencies or number of cycles per second. If we want to measure the uh, RPM, so number of cycles per minute, we need to multiply number of cycles per second times 60. And uh, if we have 60 holes in our disk, then this multiplication will be done automatically. Uh, if you are constrained in space, then you can have less holes in the ring. You can have 8 or 6 or whatever number you, you, you need. And then uh, you just uh, multiply that uh, with uh, some constant in your controller system. So both possibilities uh, are available. Now uh, here uh, you can see such an example uh, where such a speed and position sensor is used. Uh, on the right you have an example of an old computer mouse before we had optical mouses. Uh, those uh, old mouses uh, are equipped with a speed sensor uh, that is working on exactly the same principle. Uh, so here in the middle we see the ball and this ball is what was transferring the motion of the mouse and uh, it, the motion was transferred by friction from the ball into the shaft that is here and into the shaft that is here so uh, we had the x and y direction and here this ring this is nothing else than our speed sensor uh, we can see the teeth and the gaps uh, we know how many gaps we have on the wheel 
and uh, here we have a pair of uh, photo detectors and light emitters. So uh, this one is the LED, it's an infrared LED, and uh, this is a photodiode uh, or phototransistor. Uh, so uh, when the light beam is passing through the gap in the wheel, it gets detected by the detector. We have uh, some signal, typically it's uh, logic zero or it could be even one. And uh, when the light beam is blocked uh, by the uh, by the material between the uh, by, by, by the teeth, then uh, it's not visible for the detector, and uh, we have uh, another signal. So the output from this photo detector is then is then measured uh, with the circuit that we can see here. Uh, it's a simple counter that counts how many pulses uh, that we do in some unit of time. So this can act as a position sensor and uh, if we would time the number of pulses per some time unit then we can even get the speed of uh, the motion. Uh, this has a two independent axes so we have uh, X and Y axis. Uh, in both cases uh, it's the same principle here again we see the same setup. Here is the light emitter, the infrared LED and here is the detector at the photo transistor. Uh, the infrared LED typically emits at a wavelength of 850 nanometers. In some cases it's uh, about 900 nanometers. So it's uh, in the near infrared range. Uh, in some cases you can see this infrared radiation for example with a mobile phone uh, when you are with a camera that uh, you point on that and you can see how the light is being emitted. Uh, the uh, pair of photodetector and the light emitter uh, can look also like this. So we can buy it as one unit. Uh, on one side then you have the LED and uh, on the other side you have the phototransistor. So this is a single component that you uh, place on the circuit board. And uh, then in this slot here, this is where you placed your disk. Uh, for example, like this one. And uh, you have some some uh, some holes uh, on the disk prepared. Uh, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is that uh, you based your measurement on reflection from some surface. So this uh, is your object, but the, this time the object has to be equipped with a reflective surface. Uh, so it's uh, either a sticker or it's a, it's a paint that reflects uh, well the infrared radiation. Uh, in some cases, it's also working uh, a bit with the whole, with the teeth and the gaps between the teeth, so this could work as well. Uh, but uh, it would not work very well for the black surface. So in this case, uh, you would require something like a white surface. Or uh, many sensors are uh, being calibrated with gray surface with a specific color. Uh, anyway, this is again available as a single component that you place on the printed circuit board. Uh, we can see that it has a LED that projects the light beam and uh, we have a phototransistor that's our detector and this is uh, what receives the device. So this is what's inside of those uh, sensors. Uh, here on the bottom uh, picture you can see the real photograph of such a device. So again, this is mounted in the printed circuit board. Here, uh, the device on the left, that's an LED. And uh, here on the right, that's a phototransistor. You can recognize it by the number of pins that you have. Uh, here, LED needs only two pins. And here we have three pins that's for, for a phototransistor. Some devices have, has, uh, have uh, just two pins on the left, two pins on the right. So then you, can, you, you need to look into the data sheet. Uh, where uh, you need to orient it. It's not possible to orient it uh, in reverse uh, and, and uh, it would not it would not work properly. It would not work at all uh, when you place it uh, inverse in the printed circuit board. Uh, so uh, that's the optical sensor. Uh, now uh, let's see uh, the inductive sensor. Uh, in this case, the inductive sensor will again need uh, some uh, teeth and gaps and uh, we will be detecting again those teeth and gaps. Uh, in order to make it work, 
it is uh, required that uh, this wheel uh, is uh, ferromagnetic. So it will not work with a wheel of plastic, it will not work with, um, L with, uh, with uh, wood, for example. Uh, it needs to be ferromagnetic. So it has to be from iron. Uh, the way this works is uh, the following. Here uh, we have a permanent magnet. Uh, it can be just a weak permanent magnet. Uh, it can be just a magnetized piece of iron. Or it could be, a, let's call it a real permanent magnet. Now this permanent magnet is producing a magnetic field. We can see the magnetic field lines here in the picture. And uh, this magnetic field is uh, available also in the air gap between the sensor and between the, the, the teeth here. Now if uh, we will change the orientation of this wheel so that uh, at one time instant we see the teeth, at another time instant we see the gap and so on, so this is moving, uh, we will be changing the material that is under the sensor. And since this material is ferromagnetic, uh, we will also change the magnetic field. So the magnetic field will have a different shape uh, when uh, it's uh, under the sensor with the iron piece, or if it's uh, with the gap that's here between the teeth. Uh, we'll see a video in, in a second how this works. Uh, so we're changing the magnetic field. From Faraday's law, we know that uh, when we have uh, the changes of a magnetic field, then this means that uh, we can have induced voltage. And this is uh, here why we have the, this pickup coil. So this is a coil where we will be watching for the induced voltage. So as uh, here there will be the changes of the magnetic field, will be able to pick up some voltage. And uh, the amplitude and the frequency of the voltage uh, will be a function of the speed of this, of this uh, wheel. So if we measure frequency or if we measure amplitude, uh, we can get the information about RPM that we have uh, in, in, our, in our application. Uh, this is how it looks like when you simulate the magnetic field. Uh, here is the sensor itself. Uh, here in the middle uh, we can see the permanent magnet. So this is what is producing the magnetic flux. And uh, here around it uh, is the coil that uh, is uh, used as the pickup coil uh, for the sensor. Uh, the material around here is uh, typically iron, so it's uh, shielding the magnetic field from the sides. Uh, with the lines here, you can see the shape of the magnetic field. So we can see that the magnetic field lo looks like this. Uh, here it's not changing because here we don't have any changes in the material that's nearby. Uh, but here on the right side, we can see uh, the, the, the gear wheel. Uh, how it is rotating and we want to detect the speed of rotation. Now we can see that uh, as the sensor is looking on the teeth we have some shape of the magnetic field. It's also visible by the color. It's a uh, flux density shown with the color and uh, if the sensor is looking on the gap then uh, the, we have a different shape of the sensor. So we can see here that the magnetic field is changing and uh, therefore we will have some induced voltage here in this uh, in this pickup coil. Now typically the voltage that you get uh, looks like this. Uh, I forgot to, to change the, um, the titles in from Czech to English. But anyway, on the x-axis that's uh, the angle uh, of the wheel. And uh, here on the top figure we have the magnetic flux. Uh, so we can see that this is a sinusoidal dependence. And uh, here, the bottom chart, that, that's the change of magnetic flux. So it's a derivative of the first chart. Uh, whatever we use is fine for the speed detection. Uh, you can see that here uh, we have some frequency. 
and uh, this frequency corresponds well to the uh, RPM that we have and uh, when we know how many teeth we have actually on the wheel uh, we can easily uh, calculate the frequency uh, so the way this is usually done is uh, by measuring the frequency uh, the reason why we do not use uh, typically the amplitude is that uh, this uh, sensor is very sensitive to the distance between the teeth and between the sensor so uh, if we are changing this distance that we have over here uh, we will have uh, a very high impact on the amplitude of the voltage if it's getting closer we'll have uh, a higher amplitude of, of the voltage so uh, we are detecting the frequency now the sensor that uh, you may buy as an industrial sensor may look like this uh, it can look like a normal position sensor like a proximity sensor uh, you can um, use uh, inductive proximity sensors also as speed sensors uh, if uh, the reaction of the sensor is uh, fast enough in some cases uh, you need to select a different sensor because in some cases uh, the frequency of the output voltage is limited uh, you will always find in the data sheet what is the maximum frequency that this can measure and uh, then you need to calculate what frequency of the signal you will have uh, here on this picture you can see an example of such an application so this could be either speed sensor or position sensor uh, anyway it's uh, detecting the position of the teeth here and the gaps so if I count the pulses that I have from the sensor uh, I can count the I can calculate the frequency of rotation and then if I multiply this by the number of teeth I can calculate uh, what is the actual speed in RPM for example and the way this is typically used is uh, in applications where you need a very reliable speed detection so it's uh, used in um, in combustion engines, it's used in many machines uh, where you need to measure the actual speed of rotation. Uh, we can see such an example here. Uh, this is the wheel with teeth. Uh, by the way, the, the teeth, they don't need to have uh, the let's say, correct shape. So uh, it, it can be just like this, it can be rectangular teeth. You don't need to have uh, a special shape like for, for gears when you have a gearbox for example uh, but you can use it so uh, if you have a gearbox and you want to measure uh, the speed of rotation you can use directly the wheel in the gearbox as uh, as this teeth you don't need to add anything else uh, between the wheel and the sensor we have an air gap uh, the distance for the for the air gap for an inductive sensor is uh, typically very small so it's approximately one millimeter it will not be able to measure for longer distances uh, well it actually depends on the size of the sensor but uh, it's uh, definitely below one centimeter so uh, it's uh, in order of few millimeters we can see the structure here inside this soft iron pole this is uh, actually the, the pole that extends the magnetic field from the permanent magnet. So in this case we have a permanent magnet like this. And here this is uh, extending the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is going like that, like this, and like this. And of course it continues like that back to the permanent magnet. And here we have the coil that uh, is picking up the voltage. Uh, you can also replace this permanent magnet by directly magnetizing this iron pole. It works in some applications, but this gives you typically uh, less strength in uh, the magnetic field. So uh, here you see such an example of uh, this kind of inductive sensor. Uh, this is, uh, in uh, most cases, it's a passive sensor. So uh, it uh, does not require any power supply voltage. That's one of the advantages. Um, if uh, your uh, control system has a sensitive input, then uh, it can uh, directly measure the voltage and uh, this sensor does not require any power supply. So we have basically two wires uh, from the sensor and, and that's it. 
Uh, in this sensor, we can see here that this is the iron core that uh, is uh, producing the magnetic field. Uh, here around it, uh, there will, will be the coil and uh, here is the output connection. Uh, eventually, if it required, then th there will be some electronic circuit over here, but that's not the case of this sensor. Uh, it's very sensitive to the distance between the sensor and uh, the teeth, so it's sensitive to the air gap size. You can see here, this, this is an example of uh, a data sheet. So uh, they are specifying that uh, the air gap distance needs to be 0 0.8 plus minus 0 0.3 millimeters. So we need to adjust it very carefully. And uh, if it's outside of this distance, it will not work properly. If it's too close, it will work. But uh, then uh, you, are, you, you risk that uh, the sensor will hit the wheel and will damage the wheel or will damage the sensor. So uh, we cannot go to small distances, although this would be better in terms of detection. Uh, we can also see that here we have the free maximum frequency that is available. So this is uh, what is limiting you the maximum speed that you can actually measure. Uh, and uh, you calculate the, this frequency simply by multiplying RPM times uh, the number of teeth that you have in, in the, on the wheel. So if you have, for example, uh, 1000 RPM, uh, you multiply it by 60 teeth that you have and you get the, the maximum frequency. And this maximum frequency of the, of the signal uh, has to be below this frequency of the sensor. Uh, we can see the application, so this is a typical speed sensor, so uh, it, it's not supposed to work as a position sensor. Uh, this sensor that, that you see on screen is, uh, is an automotive sensor that is used uh, in automotive applications to detect speed of the wheel, for example, for ABS systems. Uh, there is another uh, limitation of this uh, sensor. Since this is an inductive sensor, uh, we are detecting inducti induced voltage. And uh, the induced voltage is a function of frequency. The higher the, the frequency, the higher the induced voltage. So this means that the sensor will not be able to produce uh, any voltage when the speed is too small. So it is limited to non-zero speeds. It cannot detect when the wheel is standing still. And uh, it is limited in a minimum frequency. So the minimum frequency is uh, typically specified as well and uh, you need to check if uh, it's suitable for your application. If it's a speed application such as uh, ABS then it might be suitable. Uh, if, it's, if you really need to detect your speed from zero then you need to use a different kind of sensor. Uh, on this chart, we can see the dependence between the voltage that we get from the sensor and uh, the RPM and the air gap size and the load resistance. So uh, here the solid lines, uh, that's uh, for distance 0 0.5 millimeters. So this is when the sensor is very close to the teeth and uh, this will give us higher voltage. If uh, we increase the size of the air gap to one millimeter, then uh, we can see that the voltage drops in a linear way. So uh, if we double the air gap, the voltage drops approximately to one half. Uh, there is another limitation. This limitation is uh, related to the load resistance that you actually connect to your sensor. Uh, rem remember that this is a passive sensor, so it's not producing uh, a voltage with and a very high current. So if you load it with uh, 100 kilo ohms resistance, it might be like a good uh, analog voltmeter, for example. Uh, then you have this curve here with those uh, with those uh, squares. Uh, but uh, if you use the same setup, so the same si same distance, same speed but you load it just with 10 kilo ohms, you can see now that the voltage has dropped and due to the voltage drops in uh, the sensor, here we have a limited uh, range where we can actually use it. So here this uh, characteristic is flat 
and in this region I cannot distinguish anymore if I have 5000 RPM, 6000 RPM or 8000 RPM because here we have zero sensitivity. So in this case we could operate the sensor only in this region but in this region we can see that it's already non-linear. So we don't have a defined uh, dependence between the speed and voltage in terms of uh, just one constant if it's not, it's not linear anymore. The same thing happens also if you uh, have a distance of one millimeter. Uh, again, we limit the range if we uh, load it uh, by 10 kilo ohm resistor. And uh, here, this, uh, this curve uh, is uh, for a 100 kilo ohm load. So uh, the ideal load from, for this kind of sensor is uh, a resistor that is uh, as high as possible. So if you use a digital voltmeter or a computer system, or if you build an amplifier that allows you to increase this resistance, then it's the, the, the best uh, connection that you can use for the sensor. So the limitation is the non-zero speed measurements. Uh, in order to overcome this problem, uh, we may use a completely different principle. Now we may use again a magnetic sensor, so properties of a magnetic field, but this time we will not be detecting uh, the, the induced voltage in the coil, but we will be detecting the magnetic field itself. So in this way we can uh, remove the disadvantage that we cannot detect uh, small or zero speeds. Now this is uh, the goal of uh, the whole sensor. Now the whole sensor is using the whole effect. You can look up uh, from, from physics what this means, but basically this means that uh, we are able to detect the magnetic field with a piece of semiconductor. So now we have basically two options. One option is uh, looking like this. It's a very similar setup to the inductive sensor. Here we have a permanent magnet this permanent magnet will produce a magnetic field that looks like this. And here we have the wheel and we have the teeth and we have the gaps. Uh, we want to detect the changes of the magnetic field. So here we have the whole sensor and uh, there will be a different magnetic field when the whole sensor is looking at the teeth or if it is looking at the gap. So uh, since now we are not looking uh, for the induced voltage, but for the magnetic field directly, uh, we are able to detect even if uh, this uh, wheel is standing still. So if the wheel is standing still, we're looking at the teeth, we have some magnetic field that we measure. If we are looking on the gap, then we have a different field that we are still able to measure uh, the strength of it. So this setup is a very common I will show you some examples on the next slide uh, it's a very common in automotive applications because it's very robust and reliable uh, it, it is not a passive sensor it's an active sensor you need a power supply for this so uh, this will have uh, at least three wires two for power supply and one will be the signal itself uh, the second option is uh, that uh, you remove the permanent magnet from the sensor and uh, you have uh, some tape or some, some wheel that uh, by itself can produce some magnetic field. On this picture it is shown as a tape. So this could be a magnetized tape uh, or it could be a magnetized strip or, or, of, uh, a, or an array of permanent magnets. So here we need just the whole sensor and that's that's all we need. And uh, here this is uh, now our object and uh, if the object is moving at this instant we would see something between the north and south magnetic field. If we uh, would measure it here we would see the south pole, here we would see the north pole. And uh, if we know what is the number of south and north poles uh, here on this tape we can easily measure the position and we can measure the speed as well. So the way it works as a position sensor is that we start from some given instant. Uh, we can say this is zero for example and then we count the pulses. We 
of course need to measure the direction of rotation as well. Uh, if we use it as a speed sensor, we need just one sensor like this, like this or like that. And uh, in this case, uh, we just count how many pulses that we obtained per some unit of time. So the advantage of this sensor is that it can work from zero speed. It can detect if the object is standing still and where is it standing still. Uh, there is a limitation again uh, with the maximum frequency. So it, it's typically limited to frequencies of a few kilohertz. So a um, very similar number as we've seen in inductive sensor. It's uh, approximately 10 kilohertz, 15 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz based on the model of the sensor. Uh, on this picture you can see some examples of such industrial hole sensors. Uh, the sensors shown on the right are the automotive versions, so it looks like the, the inductive sensor, but uh, the difference will be that here uh, there will not be the, uh, the coil that is uh, picking up the voltage, but here at the very bottom, at the very end of, this, of the box, uh, we'll have the whole sensor, and here we'll have the permanent magnet. Uh, here we can see three wires, so two will be for the power supply, one will be the signal itself. Here it's the same, so uh, red will be plus, black will be minus, and the white will be the signal itself. Now those sensors are typically powered with voltages uh, between, let's say, 9 volts to 36. The standard voltage uh, in industrial applications is uh, 24 volts, in automotive applications it's uh, 12 volts. So uh, then the signal will have the same voltage level as uh, the as you use the power supply. So it will be a logic signal, one or zero, uh, with some voltage. Uh, the sensors that you see on the left here are industrial hole sensors. Uh, they are used as uh, position sensors or speed sensors. Uh, if you use it as a speed sensor, then you just need one sensor. And uh, if you use it as a, as a position sensor, uh, then unless you have uh, a different way how to determine the, the direction of rotation, uh, you need, then in this case you need uh, two sensors. So you need two sensors like this to detect the direction of rotation and the speed. Uh, industrial sensors, they typically have this thread. Uh, it has uh, typically something like M36 uh, that's the size, like a very large screw. Uh, you can find smaller ones, uh, something like M12, M8. So uh, it can then fit in your application. And the thread here is used to align the distance between the sensor and between the object. So by moving it in the hole and by fixing it with those two nuts, uh, you are able to adjust uh, precisely the distance uh, between the sensor. Now the industrial sensors, they typically have an LED on them. So here, this, this typically from, the, from this side of the sensor and then here like this, or it could be, could be from the side. Uh, and the LED can show you if uh, the uh, sen object gets detected or uh, if it does not see the object. So you can immediately see if your sensor works properly in your application. Now in the case of automotive applications, uh, you just have the cable like this, you don't have an LED. Uh, it's uh, all encased uh, so that it's uh, resistant against dirt and oil and stuff like this. And uh, it's uh, th they don't have any LED, so you need to measure the voltage that you have on the output. An LED is not necessary at all in this case, because uh, you don't have normal access to the sensor in the car. Okay, here are a few examples from the automotive sensors. Uh, we can see uh, where they approximately can work. Uh, so here we can see that this is a whole effect sensor. Uh, it can uh, detect speed and direction. That's because here we have a pair of sensors. So uh, by using a pair of sensors, we can uh, get the orientation as well. Uh, we can see the power supply voltage, so this is a typical automotive sensor from 4.5 volts to 18 volts. So typically the power supply voltage is 12 volts. The output is a square wave, it's an, this is an active signal. 
uh, where we can directly measure the, the voltage levels. Uh, we can see that this particular sensor is limited uh, on the maximum frequency and on the minimum frequency as well. So the minimum frequency it can detect is 1 Hz, and the maximum is 15 Hz. And uh, here on the right we see a similar sensor, but uh, this one is not limited. So from 0 Hz to 15 Hz, or this looks like a different version from 2 Hz to 15 uh, There is a uh, K missing, so there should be 15 kilohertz. We have an error here in the data sheet. And uh, this is also an in-hole in sensor uh, for automotive applications, but this has a little bit uh, higher uh, power supply voltage range. Uh, what is different here is the output type. Here they say digital syncing. So this means that it has not um, an active output signal, but if the object is detected, then this will turn on to zero. And uh, you need to use an external uh, resistor. It's called a pull-up resistor in your application. Uh, the advantage is that uh, you may basically select yourself what uh, will be the output voltage level. So uh, by using, for example, 5 volt as the output voltage, you can connect it in many cases directly to a microcontroller and do whatever uh, you need to do with the signal. Now uh, here on the bottom we have uh, the third example of such a sensor. Uh, here uh, this is limited to 10 kilohertz. Again this is limiting you the maximum RPM that you can measure and uh, it's given by RPM and uh, the number of uh, teeth that we have on the wheel. Uh, we can see the distance where this operates properly, so from 0 0.5 to 1.4 millimeters. Uh, active flow, this is uh, nothing else than the digital syncing output here. Uh, it's also sometimes called an open collector output, so this is again not an active output signal, but uh, this uh, requires a pull-up resistor uh, that you connect in your circuit as well. Uh, all the sensors that you can see here are basically used in automotive applications uh, such as um, ABS system, for example. Uh, those sensors are very robust and reliable. They can operate in harsh environments. They can work with uh, high vibrations. You can see here the, the, the data about the vibrations. Uh, so it's specified for those conditions in the automotive industry. Okay. Uh, let's see uh, a last uh, speed sensor. Well, this is not a speed sensor in the proper sense, but it, it is um, more an instrument that uh, you can use to measure speed. So this is not used as a sensor, but this is used as a handheld instrument. Uh, this device is called a stroboscope. So now let's see how it works. Uh, well, I've, again, I forgot here. Uh, let me just repair this, if possible. Well, this is uh, this is a bulb. This this should be the the flashlight. And uh, here, this bulb is producing flashes. So uh, the principle is the following: whatever the light is on, I can see the reflection from uh, the reflective sticker that is placed on the rotor. So this can be a rotor of uh, my electric motor, this could be a palm, whatever you need to measure. Uh, if the light is off, I know that the sticker is there, but I do not see the reflection. So in the picture that you see here, uh, the situation is the following. Uh, I have some frequency of the flashes, F here, and uh, I have some speed in RPM and that's the speed of the road. Now in my case, in this picture, uh, the frequency of the flashes is larger than the frequency of rotation. So we can see that at one instant when uh, the light is on, for example now it was on, I have seen the reflection in this position here on top. And now as uh, there is a difference between the frequencies, uh, it looks like that the reflection is shifting. So now we will have here, this uh, reflection now will be there and now will be there. 
so it looks like the reflective sticker is rotating but uh, we know that this is simply due to the difference between the frequency of the flashes and the frequency of rotation now I can adjust the frequency of the flashes here so there is a circuit that allows me to do this so that's one possibility when I when you tune the instrument you either see this uh, when the, as the as the sticker is moving in in one direction apparently against the direction of rotation or so it looks like it's moving this way or you see the second situation uh, when uh, it looks like the sticker is moving in the same direction as the shaft is rotating again here we have the source of the flashes we can adjust the flash frequency and uh, when the light is on we see some reflection so now we have seen reflection here at this position now we'll see it here because it looks like that uh, the sticker is moving faster now we'll see it over there and the next step will be over there so in this position uh, so if your frequency of the flashes is smaller than the actual speed of rotation and it looks like then the, that the, the sticker is moving slowly like that in the same direction and uh, the result that we actually want to achieve is that we have the same frequency of the flashes from the light and the same frequency of the rotation and now it will appear as uh, the as if the reflective sticker uh, will be standing still so we can see it always at the same position although we know that this is moving it appears to be standing still so the procedure that you use with a stroboscope is the following you start with the highest frequency then you slowly decrease it until you see the sticker standing still and then you read the frequency from the display of the stroboscope and this is typically calibrated directly in RPM so this is a hand operated instrument it's not an automated sensor but uh, it's used to manually measure the speed now what problems can we have when we measure with the stroboscope now one problem is that uh, if uh, we have uh, our frequency of the flashes equal to twice the frequency of rotation now we'll see the two stickers here so we it appears as we have one sticker over there and we have one sticker over there and since we have exactly twice the frequency it will appear as uh, the stickers are standing still but we know that we have placed just one sticker on the rotor so uh, this means that this definitely is uh, wrong settings uh, where we have uh, wrong frequency a yeah, very similar thing will happen if we have uh, three times the frequency uh, so we, we will see one sticker at this position one sticker at this position and one sticker at this position uh, but we know that we have only one sticker on the rotor so again uh, this is another problem to, to see directly that uh, we have uh, three times the frequency of rotation. So this is not a problem at all. For this reason we always start from the highest frequency on the stroboscope. Uh, however, there is one problem that we cannot distinguish. And that's uh, when the frequency of rotation is uh, frequency of the flashes is one half of the frequency of rotation and then it looks like this we will see here the reflection right now now the sticker is moving here we don't see any reflection because the light is not on and now we'll see the reflection but in this case uh, we had two revolutions of the rotor and we cannot distinguish this this uh, the mark will still appear to be standing still but uh, we cannot distinguish if uh, we have uh, uh, half the 
frequency that we actually need. So for this reason you, you have to always start from the highest frequency otherwise you can miss multiple passes of uh, this uh, reflective sticker. So this is a handheld operating instrument um, and uh, it's used to manually measure the RPM. Now the way you create the reflective sticker is either that you take directly some reflective sticker relay or uh, you just uh, paint the sticker or you just paint some area on the shaft uh, with a different color. So for example you paint the whole shaft uh, with the black paint and then you just scratch out uh, some uh, some line on it or uh, you just uh, apply white paint on some region and then you will use this as the reflective sticker. So it's a very easy to use. It's not an automated instrument so it cannot uh, be connected to a control system but it's only a handheld operated instrument. So that's all for position sensors and speed sensors and now in the remaining time uh, we will discuss acceleration sensors. It's uh, very closely related to speed sensors and we'll see uh, that uh, eventually we may use also an acceleration sensor to get speed if we integrate acceleration for example. So now let's see how uh, an accelerometer works. Well the accelerometer measures the effect of uh, acceleration. So we do not measure the acceleration directly but uh, we measure some force that uh, has a fun dependence on acceleration. So the way most uh, acceleration sensors work is that they have a mass and we are detecting the movement of this mass. So we know what this mass is, we know we want to measure the acceleration and uh, we can easily measure the force. So in principle uh, it is a kind of force sensor that is using the effect of the mass uh, as uh, changed by acceleration. Now, there are many principles uh, for accelerometers. Uh, they can be either dependent on force or strain. So this is the force sensor itself. Or uh, they can be based on position sensing. So they, they are then called displacement accelerometer types. Here you can see the types uh, that we actually have. Uh, I will be talking about just one of them. I will be talking only about this capacitive sensor. And the reason for this is that this is uh, the most common today. Not because it's the most accurate, it's not. But uh, because it's uh, the most available today due to mass production in automotive industry. And in fact, you probably all have this sensor in the cell phone. And this is a capacitive accelerometer. And now let's take a look uh, on uh, the ranges uh, where we actually can use the different kind of accelerometer, accelerometers. Uh, of course, there are differences. And uh, the differences are at least in one perspective. And this is the range of frequencies that you can actually measure. An accelerometer can be used also as a vibration sensor. It's nothing else than an accelerometer. We can see that different sensors may operate at different frequencies. For example, a piezoelectric sensor or quartz or ceramic sensor uh, can operate for higher frequencies. So this is a, a typical vibration sensor but it cannot operate for low frequencies. So this piezoelectric sensor could not detect static acceleration. So it cannot be used, for example, as an orientation sensor in a cell phone, because uh, here the acceleration is uh, changing with very small frequencies. Uh, however, piezoelectric sensors are very common as vibration sensors. Now, we will be talking about the capacitive sensor which is around this region like this and we can see that this operates on the other hand in low frequency range so it can detect small 
slow changes of uh, acceleration, but it cannot operate at high frequencies. So the acceleration sensor that you have in your cell phone cannot be used as a vibration sensor, at least not for very high frequencies, and typically at 100 Hz approximately. Uh, but it can operate very well in the static range. And the other sensors are somewhere between. Some operate uh, in uh, low frequencies and large frequencies as well. Some operate in low frequencies only. So for example here, this is uh, about the same uh, frequency range as uh, you have uh, for the capacitive acceleration sensor. Now, how is this working? Uh, we need a frame. So this is my frame, this is a base plate, uh, and here we have a mass, and this mass is moving. Now if I apply acceleration in this vertical direction, uh, we will assume that the mass, due to inertial forces, will want to stay at the given position. So here this mass will move. So for example, if I move it up, like this, then the mass will stay at this position initially and what will happen is that this beam will bend and thus that this mass will move like this and uh, we will decrease the distance between this electrode and this electrode. So the way this works is that we have a capacitor between the base plate, between the frame and between the electrode like this and uh, whenever we apply acceleration, this distance will change and hence the capacitive will change. So this is a typical capacitive sensor. Uh, we typically do not measure directly the capacity between those two electrodes, but we use it as a differential bridge, as a differential capacitor. We have actually seen this already on the second lecture for position sensing. So we have a setup like this. We have two electrodes that are fixed. That's this one, this is the fixed electrode, and this one is the fixed electrode. And this electrode in the middle, that's actually the one that's moving. So here this uh, would, electrode would be connected to the mass that we have here. Now this is typically done in silicon uh, in, in, in a chip and uh, the mass and uh, the electrode is interconnected and then the mass is moving. Now here we have two capacitors. We have one capacitor here, let's call it C1, and we have another capacitor here, let's call it C2. Uh, both are changing with the changes of position. Uh, if we connect them in this kind of circuit, uh, then uh, we can get the output voltage. Now this is only one half of the circuit the other half would be uh, either very similar with, uh, again, two variable capacitors or uh, it would be composed from uh, two fixed capacitors. Uh, in any case, the output will be voltage. So this is uh, called uh, a capacitive bridge. Now let's take a look inside. Here you have a few pictures how this actually is looking like. So I will start from the picture, let's let's start from this picture on top right. Uh, here in the center, you can see this is the mass. So this is uh, what is actually uh, being influenced by the inertial forces. Now if I apply force in this direction like this, now this mass will want to stay at rest and uh, then it will move. Uh, we need a spring system to uh, actually position the mass correctly and uh, to dampen the, the motion. So this is the spring system over here and over there. It's all etched in silicon. And here on the left and on the right, you can see the sets of electrodes. So this is the movable electrode and this is the movable electrode. And here we have the fixed electrode on the frame and fixed electrode on the other side of the frame. Now the reason why we have uh, several sets of electrodes is that we need to increase sensitivity. Uh, if we were to use just uh, one uh, electrode, then the sensitivity would be too small and we would not be able to detect the capacitive changes. So here you have several sets of electrodes on, on every side of the mass.
Now this is a model of course, you can see approximately the dimensions so 0 0.1 millimeter, 0 0.15 millimeters. Anyway, it's a, it's a very small device. Uh, those uh, devices are called MEMS accelerometers, uh, which, call, uh, which stands for Micro Electromechanical Systems. Uh, it's produced with a very similar technology like uh, integrated circuits from silicon. Uh, here you can actually see the microscope picture of the set of electrodes. So this is the mass itself, you can see over there. And uh, this is uh, the movable electrode, so it moves like this. And here we can see this is the set fixed electrode and this is the fixed electrode as well. And we have several sets again here and here and here, so that we want to increase the sensitivity. Uh, it can look also like this. Uh, this is another um, version of um, the same device as an accelerometer. Uh, again, this is the mass in the middle. So this, this uh, can move like this and like that, so, so in two axes. And uh, here we see the set of electrodes. So uh, here we have the terminals for the fixed electrodes and here are the movable electrodes. So now on this picture we can see that this is at least a 2D accelerometer. Uh, we don't see the third axis, so we don't know if it's uh, if it's a three three axial accelerometer. But anyway, this set of electrodes like this uh, will detect the motion in this direction, and uh, this set of electrodes over there will detect the motion in this direction like that. And here you can see this is the the spring system that acts uh, against the mass to maintain it in the central position and uh, to dampen the motion if it, if it will be vibrating too much. So the, here uh, we can see that this is actually insulated so that here uh, this connects to one side of the spring and here this just this pin connects to another side and then this is acting like a spring. We can see again the dimension so this is a little bit larger so this is 100 micrometers um, it will fit in the chip and the chip uh, when you buy it then typically looks like this. So uh, in some cases uh, it is uh, only a single axis so it measures acceleration in one direction. In some cases you require two or three axes so then this is integrated in the chip and uh, you have then a three axial accelerometer for example. Again, this is a same device, similar similar structure inside. Uh, the the main difference is in the range in sensitivity, and the difference is of course in accuracy. Uh, and uh, where can we actually use the sensor? Well, it's all started in the automotive, uh, where those sensors so were used uh, as uh, sensors for airbags. So when you crash into something, then, then this, this acceleration gets detected and it fires the airbag. And then it moved uh, in cell phones where now the accelerometer sensors, uh, they detect the orientation. So that they can detect if the display should face uh, uh, like, a, like a landscape orientation or uh, a portrait orientation. So. Uh, it detects uh, today the orientation in, in the cell phones. Uh, I recommend you to take a look on this video. Uh, it uh, shows you what is actually inside of this cell phone. How does it work? There is a nice animation uh, explaining all the principle in motion. Uh, those are uh, some examples of uh, capacitive acceleration sensors. Uh, I have selected uh, a three axial sensor, so uh, it has X, Y, and Z axis. Uh, it is possible to have uh, two output signals, either an analog output or digital bus. Uh, now the analog output means that uh, you have a voltage that is proportional to the acceleration. So for example, the, the ones I have selected as examples have those sensitivities. You can see that uh, it's uh, given uh, typically as a uh, millivolts per G and uh, based on the range and power supply voltage uh, you have some offset in the voltage because you want to detect positive and negative acceleration as well. 
So we can see that here we can select different ranges uh, as required for our application. Uh, another example where those acceleration sensors are used are is for example hard drives. Uh, if you have uh, a notebook then you need to protect the hard drive uh, against uh, some uh, hits uh, when when um, you don't hold it properly in your hands and uh, it uh, could fall on the table for example then the hard drive needs to be stopped very soon very quickly so this is done by the uh, by the acceleration sensor that's in the hard drive so uh, some accelerometers they actually have uh, an output that can detect free fall so if you if you uh, let it fall down then uh, it gets detected and very quickly the, the hard drive will be stopped before it hits uh, the ground and uh, before the hard drive gets destroyed uh, now some acceleration sensors they actually have uh, several outputs so this particular sensor has an analog voltage as an output uh, but it has also a digital bus so those i square c and the spa are digital buses uh, in both cases you can just read uh, the acceleration you can read other data as well some of them have temperature sensors to, com to uh, compensate uh, for temperature changes, for example. Now, in many cases today, uh, we need to combine the accelerometer with the gyroscope. So, uh, I will now show you the gyroscope that will be the last sensor in this group. And we'll see that it works in a very similar way to the accelerometer. Uh, the difference between the accelerometer and gyroscope is uh, in uh, what does it measure. The accelerometer measures uh, linear acceleration, so x, y and z axis. On the other hand, gyroscope measures angular velocity. So if we have a system like this, x, uh, uh, x y and z axis, then the linear accelerometer would measure us linear acceleration along those axes, but the gyroscope will measure us angular velocity. So here shown as omega in the, in the z, z axis, uh, we could use it in all three axes. So then we have uh, angular velocity in all three axes. So very often we combine this in a single package, in a single chip, uh, we have an accelerometer, we have a gyroscope, and eventually a magnetometer. Uh, and we can then uh, get the whole orientation of our device. So this could be used for a drone. It could be used uh, for a cell phone to orient itself in the picture uh, in, the, in the world. It could be used for a robot to orient itself in the world. So now how is the gyroscope working? Well, this kind of gyroscope is taking advantage of the Coriolis force. Now, what is the Coriolis force? Now, imagine that uh, we have an object like this. This object has some mass. Now, this object is moving with a velocity in the x-axis. And uh, now this object is rotating. So here it's rotating with uh, some uh, angular speed omega. And in this case, the Coriolis force will act in this direction. And uh, its size will be given by this equation. So minus 2 times the mass times the angular speed. And now this is times the speed, the linear speed here in the x-axis. Now note that this is a vector sum. So uh, the Coriolis force will be measured in the plane that is perpendicular to the x and z axis here over there so now if, if we have some way to measure this Coriolis force we'll see in, in the next slide how this is done uh, then by measuring this Coriolis force I can get uh, for example the angular speed if I know the linear speed here now the way it's typically used is that uh, we have uh, this done three times so that we can measure in three axes so those axes are then typically called the pitch, roll, and yaw axis. So that here in those three axes, uh, we can measure the angular speed. 
Now the way this works is uh, very similar to the accelerometer principle. Uh, here you have uh, such an example. Now let's do this. Let's have a mass here on the left and a mass here on the right. And now between those two masses we'll have a spring. Now we will apply some velocity here, some linear velocity here, V and V. Uh, so this mass will move to the right and this mass will move to the left. Now after some time we'll reverse this speed and uh, this mass will move to the right and this mass will move to the left like this. So in fact this will do nothing else than moving back and forth like this and uh, back and forth like this. So it will be vibrating. Now we know the speed here. This speed that's what we actually create. So this is uh, created by uh, some electrostatic system for example. So we move this back and forth. Uh, we want to measure the angular velocity here in the z-axis. So uh, we know that the Coriolis force on this mass will act in this direction and on this mass will act on this direction. So now if we are able to measure the position of this mass in this axis, in the y-axis, and here also in the y-axis, now we can measure the Coriolis force and we can calculate what is the actual angular speed. So the way it's done is uh, visible here on this structure. So it's a very similar structure to the accelerometer with one exception. And the exception is that uh, we need to imply some movement here on the x-axis. So uh, we create some motion with electrostatic field. Uh, here this will be harmonic motion back and forth. Uh, and uh, we measure the displacement here in the y direction. So it will probably be a little bit better visible here in this picture. Uh, here you see such an example of uh, the gyroscope, what's actually visible under the microscope. Uh, here in the middle we can see this is our mass, so this is what is moving. And here we can see different sets of electrodes. Here those electrodes over there and over there, they are used to create the motion. So we, they make it vibrate with a specific speed. And here we have uh, sets of electrodes that allow us to uh, actually detect uh, the motion of uh, this sensor. Uh, now this looks like uh, it's a two axial gyroscope, so it would have uh, one axis like this and one axis like that. It's called also a tuning fork gyroscope because you can imagine that uh, the one piece of the electrodes looks like a tuning fork. So it's uh, looking like this. This is, an, of course, an exaggerated example of the rotation. We can see that initially here, this is the motion that we apply. So this is vibrating like this. And if we apply the rotary motion, then uh, one electrode is moving uh, on the, to, the, to the back and the other electrode is moving to the front due to the Coriolis forces, which then uh, we can measure uh, with uh, capacitive sensing. So again, this is a capacitive sensor. We measure with a capacitive sen sensor the distance between the electrode that's here and between some frame. Uh, I have here uh, another example of uh, uh, the insides of such a sensor. So let's take a look first on this picture on the right. Here we see just a detail of uh, the electrodes. So again, here we have the mass. Uh, this is uh, the set of electrodes that uh, is, uh, is in the middle. And here we have the mass that is actually moving. So this is moving like that. It's uh, then changing the distance between the electrodes here and electrodes there. And uh, we can measure this. So this is one mass. This is actually what corresponds to one mass that we have here on the right. Now the second mass that we have here on the left that uh, would be this piece here over there. Uh, again, we have one electrode here and one set of electrodes there. So now if we make this vibrate, 
uh, and uh, if this is rotating like this uh, then uh, this will move like that uh, due to the Coriolis force and this will move like this due to, due to the Coriolis force of course it depends on the direction of rotation if it will if it will move in the other direction other rotation this will move like this and this will move like that uh, and here we see uh, the, the chip as a whole uh, we can see that uh, here uh, those uh, electrodes are used to sense the Coriolis force in this case so this is the sensor uh, it, this is the same structure like this the same is over there so this is sensing the direction of the Coriolis force and size uh, this is uh, the drive direction so we make it vibrate like this left and right and we do this by those uh, drive fingers again it's a capacitive sensor so by electric field this is moving back and forth and again here we have uh, the direction which we actually want to detect so if the direction of rotation is like this then the Coriolis force for this half of the sensor will work in this way so this will move down and for this half uh, it will work it will work in, in up direction and uh, this will move upwards okay uh, so let's see uh, in electrical way what is actually inside of a gyroscope uh, so uh, we need a set of electrodes so this is uh, this is here uh, this is an example of a two axial gyroscope so it measures in x and z direction so this is uh, the set of electrodes uh, we need to amplify the signal so this is done here uh, with the charge amplifier uh, we need to drive the motion so here uh, we have a driving ma circuit for the dri driving mass so this is a circuit that actually produces the electric field here in those uh, drive fingers that we have and uh, at the end we need to subtract this motion remove the motion from uh, the output signal so this uh, from this charge amplifier and here we subtract that in the demodulator and then this is a low pass filter and uh, we remove uh, frequencies higher than a certain uh, threshold and optionally we may have some uh, high pass or low pass filter and the output it may be in the chip or uh, it may be an external circuit so the output of the signal is uh, the angular velocity in the x-axis, angular velocity in the z-axis. You may find also uh, gyroscopes for a single axis or for three axis as well. It again depends on the application that you that you need. Uh, here we can see such an example. So it's a very similar chip to the accelerometer very small square of few millimeters three by three for example four by four millimeters approximately uh, very often it is then combined uh, into a single device uh, with an accelerometer and magnetometer uh, here we see uh, the, the data sheet uh, for the gyroscope so uh, this is uh, the sensitivity and the measurement range so this, the measurement range is given by degrees per second that's here this, this DPS uh, and uh, the sensitivity is typically given in millivolts per degrees per second uh, this is a gyroscope that has an analog output so it has a voltage output and you see the voltage is uh, proportional to the angular speed now many sensors uh, can have also a digital output so then this is not given as a sensitivity but uh, then you have range and then you have the minimal resolution that's uh, giving you how many bits you actually have uh, in the sensor itself uh, at the end uh, all those sensors are typically combined in a, an inertial measurement unit uh, here you see just two examples uh, the one uh, on the right here is, uh, let's call it a hobby IMU uh, that you can get very cheaply uh, if you are building a drone or a robot. Uh, the one on the left here that's, uh, that's a commercial 
uh, unit for airplanes so this has um, certified outputs uh, it's reliable it's backed up and so on uh, it will be also a lot more expensive uh, typically what's inside an IMU is uh, a three axial gyroscope so gyroscope that measures in three axes we have a three axial accelerometer we have a three axial magnetometer so this measures the orientation of the magnetic field and uh, typically we have a pressure sensor as well that's, that's uh, at least the case of this sensor uh, that uh, you see as a commercial unit now this uh, sensor doesn't look like it has a, it has a pressure sensor so this looks like it's a one well I don't know which one but uh, at least one of them is the magnetometer one of them is the accelerometer and one of them is the is the accelerometer uh, the, the other chip this probably would be uh, like a microprocessor to process the data uh, you can find this also as uh, one single chip so for example this this uh, is from a data sheet from such a sensor uh, we can see that it has a gyroscope accelerometer magnetometer pressure sensor temperature sensor all in one unit and uh, then the output is here on this bus uh, SPI bus so we can read out through this SPI bus uh, all the data it can also combine those data to give you directly the orientation and uh, that you actually need so typically uh, we need to read the acceleration we need to use angular velocity we need to read the angles uh, here you have just a comparison between the two units to give you an idea what can we expect so this one on the right that's uh, the example of the integrated chip so here we can see the range for the accelerometer plus minus 18 g's uh, we can see the magnetometer here plus uh, minus 0.25 gauss so this is uh, possible to use like uh, like a electronic compass and um, they don't give us here the estimate of the range for for velocity but we will certainly find it in the data sheet and uh, the pressure sensor uh, here we can see the range so this could be used for example to uh, measure the altitude if you're flying a robot then you can use this pressure to get the altitude above sea level uh, here on the left we have uh, the data from the uh, commercial unit so it sends you the data through a serial line that you can connect directly to a computer with this speed this is the operating voltage not, not, not very typical 3.3 3 .3 volts would be probably the operating voltage and uh, here uh, we can see what outputs can we get we can get the pitch roll and yaw so this directly calculates the orientation in, in space as angles and uh, we can use this to, to get the orientation of the airplane or the orientation of our drone that we are flying uh, here we can see the approximate ranges so 400 degrees per second that's for the gyro and plus minus 3 g's for the accelerometer so uh, we, we could find similar data for the magnetometer and so on for the for the pressure sensor as well okay that's it